Okay. Um, well, we are moving along, and as if some of you are noticing, the pace is picking up, and um, that's good if you want to cover a lot of material. So, um, last time I finished uh, with talking about what chromatin was, and uh, that's where I'm going to uh, start today. So, chromatin is, as I noted, a complex between proteins and DNA. The DNA wraps around proteins. The proteins are called histones. And histones are um, interesting proteins. We only see histones in eukaryotic cells. We don't see histones in bacteria, which are prokaryotic. Okay? So eukaryotic cells contain histones. And eukaryotic cells, not coincidentally, contain uh, quite a bit more DNA than prokaryotic cells do. All right? uh, to give you an idea, a human being has about 7 billion base pairs of DNA. Um, E. coli, a bacterium that lives in our gut, has uh, about 3 million. So roughly a 1,000-fold, 2,000-fold difference between the DNA content of a human and a bacterium. Okay? Uh, so that's quite a bit more. Now you say, well, okay, eukaryotic cells are bigger than prokaryotic cells, so that accommodates things to some extent. But if we look at the size of the nucleus where the uh, DNA is kept, it's not much bigger than a bacterial cell. So you're squeezing in with histones about 1,000 times more DNA into the same space. That's pretty darn good. And so uh, bacteria which don't have histones don't wrap up their DNA like we do, and it tells us how much we can really um, put together with that. The uh, histones are a set of basic proteins, meaning that they are positively charged. Okay? At physiological pH, histones are positively charged. That works out really well because DNA is negatively charged. Those phosphates that you saw on DNA yesterday all have a negative charge on them. So as you know, positives attract negatives, and it makes it very easy to hold these guys together. Okay? There are four histones that are found, and they're found in two pairs of four. That is, uh, each one is duplicated. In, in each of those little circles that you see here. Okay? So this little circle that you see right there is called a nucleosome. That is what a, an individual wrapped core of histones with DNA is called. The overall structure, everything, is called chromatin. But there's a nucleosome that you can see right there. Okay, well, I'm not going to say much more about those, but as you might imagine, having histones and having DNA wrapped around a protein makes what happens inside of eukaryotic cells much, much more complicated than what happens in prokaryotic cells. The DNA in prokaryotic cells is essentially naked. So proteins like DNA polymerase that replicates the DNA can interact with it very readily. In eukaryotic cells, proteins that interact with the DNA first have to get rid of those histones. And it's a very complicated process, more than we're going to go into in a class like this. But I do want to make you aware of the fact that it is another order of complexity that's present in eukaryotic cells. OK. Um, another thing I want to say about DNA. Uh, Dr. McFadden, when he talked about proteins, probably told you that you could denature proteins. Am I correct in that or not? OK. So when you denature a protein, you are basically unfolding it and you're changing its native shape. DNA can also be denatured. DNA exists normally in the cell as a double helix. But if we uh, take and we destroy the uh, hydrogen bonds that are holding the bases together, the strands will come apart. So that phenomenon is known as denaturation, just like it's called denaturation in proteins. And not surprisingly, one of the ways in which we denature proteins is also by heating it up, because hydrogen bonds help stabilize protein structure as well. Okay? So heat overcomes the energy that's found in those hydrogen bonds. This is a plot of the temperature that a mixture, that a, that a solution of DNA is in, and compared to the absorbance. That is, if the absorbance, we shine light through something, okay, it will absorb specific uh, substances will absorb specific wave, wavelengths of light, meaning they don't let that light pass through. Okay. What we see is that 
as we increase the temperature, the absorbance goes up. And what's actually happening is the double-stranded DNA, which was down here, is becoming single-stranded. What you see on the screen is a depiction of what we call the hyperchromic effect. Hyperchromic, meaning hyper meaning more, additional. Chromic meaning color. So color arises as a result of absorption. And so we're seeing more absorption happening as temperature goes up. And that more absorption is happening because single strands absorb radiation better than double strands. Okay. Now that, this process here becomes important. Later we're going to talk about techniques in biotechnology where we actually have to separate the strands of DNA in order to make something happen. So I'll come back later to talk about why denaturation is important. The TM here, people call the transition temperature. You're probably more likely to call it the melting temperature because that's the place where the strands come apart. At this point, they're halfway apart. OK. Um, and let's see. There's some more stuff. OK. All right. Well, the other type of nucleic acid that we talk about, of course, is RNA. And RNA, as I'm sure you know from basic biology, is copied from DNA. Okay? The copying of RNA requires an enzyme called an RNA polymerase. We'll talk about that later. But RNA polymerase reads the sequence in DNA and builds a complementary RNA strand using the same rules of base pairing that we've already talked about. Where it sees a C, it puts in a G. Where it sees an A, it puts in a T, etc. Okay. One thing I didn't tell you, uh, but I should, is that I'm sure you probably have learned this in basic biology, and that is that the strands of any nucleic acid are what we call anti-parallel. Anti-parallel. It doesn't mean they're perpendicular. That's one way of thinking of anti-parallel. That's not what it means. What it means is if we look at that orientation that I talked about yesterday, where this strand is going 5 prime, 3 prime, from my knuckle to the end of my finger, when it base pairs with another strand, it's in this orientation. Notice that the end of my finger is opposite the end of this finger. They're anti-parallel. If they were parallel, they would be like that. That would mean that 5 prime and 3 prime and 5 prime and 3 prime were the same. In this case, the 5 prime and 3 prime of the top strand is opposite the 5 prime and 3 prime of the bottom strand. Now, that will become important as we talk about how DNA is replicated. And it's also important as we talk about how RNA is synthesized. Okay? One of the things that we discover about nucleic acids is that there's some things about all nucleic acids that are always true. All right? There's very few things in biology that we can say always is the case. But this is one. One of the things that's always true about nucleic acids is that they are always made in the same direction. They're made starting at the 5 prime end and moving towards the 3 prime end. The newest part of a nucleic acid being made will always be the 3 prime end. Okay? This is true for making RNA, it's true for making DNA. Now I'm going to talk about making of RNA in a couple of days, so I'm not going to talk more about the synthesis here. But I want you to be aware of those things. When we talk about RNAs, we, we discover there's actually several different classes of RNAs that exist. Okay? Three of these classes we talk about a lot. All right? One is called transfer RNA. Transfer RNA looks kind of like a clover leaf. And you'll see that structure later. And transfer RNA is, uh, has a dual role. At one end of the transfer RNA, is a sequence that base pairs with the messenger RNA during translation. Translation is the synthesis of protein. At the other end of that transfer RNA is attached an amino acid that is specific corresponding to what that sequence is it's pairing with. That's actually how the genetic code is read. We'll talk about that later, so I don't want you to get too hung up on that right now. But transfer RNA allows for the genetic code to be read. It brings the amino acids in that become the protein. 
So transfer RNA is transferring both information and it's transferring amino acids. And because it's transferring information and amino acids together, it makes a specific sequence of amino acids that corresponds to what was originally the sequence of the DNA that the messenger RNA was made from. Again, I'm going to talk about that later, but just to give you just a hint of what's going to happen. Okay? The second RNA that we talk about a lot is ribosomal RNA. I'm not going to say too much about it here, but ribosomes are complexes where translation occurs. Okay? They're complexes where translation occurs, and translation, as I said, is the synthesis of protein. So we have these complexes. Part of those complexes are specific RNA molecules called ribosomal RNAs. They're ribosomal because they're part of the ribosome. Okay? We'll see the functions that they have later. The third major type of RNA that I want to talk about is messenger RNAs. And messenger RNAs, all of these are copied from DNA, by the way. But messenger RNAs contain the sequence of a protein to be made. That's what a messenger RNA does. It's a messenger carrying it from the DNA to the ribosome. It carries that information so that the ribosome can say, oh, here's what you want me to make. We can think of the messenger RNA as having the blueprint for making the protein. The blueprint for making the protein. And again, we'll talk about these. Now, there are some other RNAs that we have discovered in recent years that do some really interesting things. I'm going to talk about some of those later. And for the, when I talk about them later, I'm basically going to group them all together. They all play roles okay, in helping to control how much protein is being made. All right? So you see small nuclear RNA, you see small interfering RNA, and you see microRNA, all of which have the common feature of being small, micro being a word for small. Okay? They're small, and they affect they actually help to control how much protein is, is made for a given, protein, for a given uh, messenger RNA sequence. Okay? And we'll see how that happens later. Okay. So those are the major types. You can see here the overall process uh, occurring. And this overall process occurs in eukaryotic cells differently than it occurs in prokaryotic cells. The synthesis of RNA in each case is the same. That is, the RNA is copied from the DNA using the base pairing rules and an RNA polymerase, like I said. Two differences we see in eukaryotic cells. Okay. One is that in eukaryotic cells, we have a nucleus. We don't have a nucleus in prokaryotic cells. Transcription happens in the nucleus of prokaryotic cell, I, 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 I'm sorry, the, the nucleus of eukaryotic cells, right? Hi. Okay? It is, there's no nucleus in prokaryotic cells. In a eukaryotic cell, the sequence is copied. The messenger RNA that's made is then kicked out of the nucleus and pushed out into the cytoplasm. And that's important because in the cytoplasm, that's where the ribosomes are, and that's where translation will occur. So in the eukaryotic cell, we have separation. We have transcription in the nucleus. We have translation in the cytoplasm. In the prokaryotic cell, there's no nucleus. Everything is cytoplasm. So both transcription and translation are occurring in the same place, and they can be occurring at the same time. That's what's depicted up here on the top. In prokaryotes, we see this gene being copied. And as it's being copied, there's the messenger RNA that's being made. We see the ribosomes attaching themselves and starting to make that protein. Okay? So transcription and translation can occur at the same time in the same place 
in a prokaryotic cell, that can't happen in a eukaryotic cell. That was one difference. Okay. The second difference is that in eukaryotic cells, genes are in pieces. They're not intact. If we look in prokaryotic cells, genes are intact. Meaning, what does it mean? All right. Here's gene A, here's gene B, here's gene C. Okay? This is one gene, a second gene, a third gene. You don't see anything interrupting A, you don't see anything interrupting B, and you don't see anything interrupting C. In eukaryotic cells, it's much more complicated. Here's gene A, but gene A, in this case, has two pieces. One piece here in blue, and another piece over here in blue. And those pieces have to be put together in the right way in order for translation to occur. If they don't get put together in the right way, then translation will include things that shouldn't be there. Those things that shouldn't be there are called introns, and those things that should be there are called exons. Now, I'll talk more about this later again. But I just want to expose you to it because this process I've just described to you is called splicing. Splicing is a process that occurs only in eukaryotic cells. And it involves putting the pieces of genes together so that they can be translated. Splicing occurs in the nucleus. Splicing occurs in the nucleus. OK, so there's some differences between the way RNAs are made in eukaryotes and prokaryotes. All right. There's the cloverleaf structure I talked about for the transfer RNAs. Okay. Transfer RNAs are fairly short. They may be about 100 nucleotides or so long. It's one strand. There's the five prime end right there where my pointer is. We follow that all the way around. OK? We get over here, and we see there's the other end. That's one intact strand. So there's the three prime end, and there's the five prime end. You'll notice in the middle of that, there's base pairs. Base pairing can happen within a given strand. Base pairing can happen within a strand. Here's 5 prime to 3 prime moving down on this strand. Here's 5 prime to 3 prime moving up on this strand. They're anti-parallel, even if it's in one strand. Okay. All right. Transfer RNAs are also odd in having a lot of modified nucleotide bases. Okay, we don't completely understand why this is the case, but there is actually chemical modification that occurs to many of the bases that are found in a transfer RNA. So transfer RNA is unusual in that respect. Okay, and no, you don't need to know which ones there are, but you should know that transfer RNAs do have modified bases. The other uh, RNAs don't have as much in the way of that. Okay. There's a structure for you to memorize, right? It's a horrible figure. You can't really see that. What that is uh, is a ribosomal RNA. You can see pretty quickly that ribosomal RNA is bigger than transfer RNA. And you can see that the complexity of the structure, I wouldn't describe that as a clover leaf, right? In fact, I'm not sure what I would describe that as, other than maybe a big knot. But just like the transfer RNA, it's one strand. One strand, starting right there at the 5 prime end, going through all this gibberish, 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 and ending right over there at the 3 prime end. You might wonder, why does this have such an odd structure? Okay. The reason it has such an odd structure is that it's actually, we can think of it like a scaffolding that the proteins that are part of the ribosome hold on to. So it provides sort of a basic structure, a structural element of the ribosome. 
That's one of the things that this thing does. Okay. okay. And there are, actually, I'm not going to talk about that now. I'll save that for later. And I'll save that for later as well. Okay. So that's what I want to tell you about. Oh, I don't, one other thing I wanted to tell you. I almost forgot. Uh, if I go back to the transfer RNA, I forgot to mention, I said that I've got two things. One that forms base pairs with the messenger RNA during translation. That occurs down here in loop two. This part of the transfer RNA forms a base pair with a three base sequence in the messenger RNA. That was one of the elements. The other element I said was the amino acid is attached to the other end. And the amino acid gets attached right there where it says the three prime hydroxyl. Okay. During the process of translation, the amino acid is transferred from the transfer RNA into the growing polypeptide chain that's becoming the protein. Okay, questions? Okay. Let's uh, turn our attention now to the first of the processes involving the nucleic acids, and that's DNA replication. Okay. DNA replication. How many here have heard of the central dogma? Only a few. Okay. Basic biology. Either basic biology is not teaching that, or you're lying, or your memory is short. There's one of the three. That's all I can. I have to conclude. Okay. I will assume basic biology is not teaching that, so I will show you the central dogma. Okay? The central dogma is depicted on the screen, and the central dogma basically says the following. It says DNA codes for RNA codes for protein. It says that information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. That's the central dogma. That was, just, that was proposed long ago, actually back in the 60s, not too long after the structure of DNA was recognized. Okay? DNA copies itself. Right? The process of going from DNA to RNA, I've already told you, is called transcription. The process of going from RNA to protein is translation, as I described to you. When people first proposed the central dogma, they said, this is a one-way street. Okay? You can go from left to right, but you can't go from right to left. Well, that turned out not to be true. When the 1970s came along, probably more, yeah, 19, certainly by 1970s came along, it became apparent that there were certain enzymes that could copy RNA and make DNA from RNA. They could make DNA using RNA and copying it. Okay? Well, that seemed to be the reverse of everything we had thought of before. So instead of calling it transcription, which was going from left to right, they called it reverse transcription, which is going from right to left. Yes? Yeah, I'm getting ready to say that. Um, but it actually occurs in your cells as well. So I'll say just a brief word about that too. Okay. Now, this process of going from right to left, as her question said, was it was discovered first in viruses. It was discovered in a class of viruses known as retroviruses. And you've heard that term retrovirus before, described with things like HIV. HIV is a retrovirus. And it turns out there are many retroviruses. Okay? They're called retroviruses because they start out as RNA. And they have an enzyme that copies that RNA and makes DNA from it. The enzyme, to help you memorize it easier, is called a reverse transcriptase because it's catalyzing the process of reverse transcription. Reverse transcriptase copies RNA, makes DNA. HIV is a prime example of that. Okay. Now, what we've learned since that time, reverse transcriptases and so forth were known from about the early, late 70s, early 80s. What we've learned since that time 
is that we have enzymes in our bodies that have nothing to do with viruses that also use RNA and copy DNA. They do it in a different way and for a different reason. I'm going to talk about that when I finish talking about DNA replication because it turns out that to copy our chromosomes and do things with our chromosomes that are linear, our chromosomes are linear, bacterial chromosomes are circular as we will see, copying linear chromosomes has some issues. And one of those issues is how we replicate the ends. And I'll talk about that later. So we do have this happen in our cells as well, but the process was discovered in, pro in, in um, viruses. Okay, we don't have anything that goes from protein back to RNA. There are some viruses that start out as RNA and they get copied as RNA. That's what this is showing right here. Okay? So just like we have DNA can replicate itself and make more DNA, some viruses start out as RNA and make RNA. We don't have a process like that in our cells. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about DNA replication. All right? DNA replication was the, was the first process involving DNA that was discovered. When Watson and Crick, and I always put in parentheses Franklin, described the, what DNA looked like, there was a little paragraph at the end, okay, or not a paragraph, but there was a single line at the end that says, it had not escaped their attention that base pairing might explain how DNA was copied. Okay, how DNA was copied because we knew A went with T, G went with C. If you had one strand, it was quite easy to figure out how you would make the other strand because the rules were very simple. Well, that set in motion a series of uh, researchers working on how DNA replicated. Okay? We can imagine DNA replication occurring by a couple of processes. One is the one you see on the screen. It's called semi-conservative, semi meaning that one strand gets copied and ends up with one new strand and one, I'm sorry, one new strand in gold and one old strand in blue. And over here, the same thing happens. One old strand in blue and one new strand in gold. Each daughter then has one parental and one new strand. That's what semi-conservative refers to. The other possibility was that replication was conservative, meaning that we started with two strands over here, and we made a new copy that had two gold strands. That's also possible. Okay? So there were some famous experiments that were done that later demonstrated that this mechanism that you see here was the correct one. It was actually done by um, Frank's, uh, John Messelson and Frank Stahl. Okay? Uh, John, what's his name? Matthew Messelson and, and Frank Stahl. Frank Stahl uh, later was a professor at the University of Oregon. This was one of the most famous experiments done in DNA. It was done before we had the enzymes because they were very clever in designing an experiment that told them that this occurred. I won't go through it here. If you want to hear it, come, come talk to me. Okay. Semi-conservative replication occurs. So it means that one strand is copied directly off of the other. That's basically what semi-conservative replication means. This shows what happens in replication of an E. coli chromosome, which is circular, on the left, in contrast to what happens in a eukaryotic replication, as shown on the right. Okay? Turns out that E. coli replication is the most studied. It's, it's better understood than replication of our own DNA is because it's simpler. Okay? Replication of DNA starts at a very specific point place in the DNA. It's a specific sequence of bases called an origin. An origin is the place where the replication process starts. That's true whether it is our cells or it's an E. coli cell. They have different sequences, but the point is that they both have a specific place where replication starts. If we look at what happens in an E. coli cell, there's only one origin per the entire circle of bacterial DNA. One origin. That origin starts and moves bidirectionally outward from that starting point. 
So you see it started here, and then it's now moving bidirectionally out. In our cells, our chromosomes are way bigger. If we only had one replication origin, it would take forever for the cells to, to duplicate. So we have multiple replication origins. And as we will see, the linear ends are a problem. In the case of E. coli, there's no linear end. They don't have that same problem that we do. Okay. Okay. The enzyme that catalyzes DNA replication is called a DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase works by looking at one strand and saying, oh, there's a T, I've got to put an A in. Oh, there's a C, I've got to put a G in, etc. And what the DNA polymerase does is really two things there. One, it's reading the other strand. And number two, it's covalently linking those bases together. It's making phosphodiester bonds. DNA polymerase is making phosphodiester bonds. Because if you don't put the nucleotides together, you're not going to have a strand. It's all going to come apart, right? You've got to put those things together. Okay. So here is the polymerase reading this strand, and it's putting these guys together. You'll notice that the nucleotides come in as triphosphates. I don't think I told you yesterday talking about nucleotides, but I'll give you an abbreviation we frequently use. Okay? When we have deoxyribonucleotides, that's the ones that go into DNA, we put a little D in front of them. So we could have DATP would be the DNA nucleotide equivalent of ATP, which is what is in RNA. We could have DGTP that would correspond to GTP, DCTP that corresponds to CTP, and DTTP that corresponds to DUTP. Uh, it corresponds to UTP in the um, bacterial cells. Did I screw that up? Nobody's paying attention anymore, right? Ds for the DNA, no Ds for the RNA. Okay. All right. I gotta slow down. You guys want a joke? All right. If you've watched my videos, you've probably heard this joke because it's my favorite joke in the world. Okay? So if you, if you know the answer, don't give it away. It ruins my joke. Okay? All right. This is my favorite joke. It really is my favorite joke. It's about Artie the Hitman. Have you heard this? How many have heard me tell this joke on video? You've heard this. Then you, can't, then it, you are dead if you tell the part punchline. Okay? All right. So Artie is this little guy who's working the neighborhood, right? And he decides that, well, my career is I'm going to kill people for a living. Okay. Oh, no, oh, yeah, okay. Somebody else heard it now. All right. I'm going to kill people for a living, right? And so he looks out there, and, you know, you look at how those things are done in the world today. And if you want something, you give something away for free, or you give it away for very cheap so a lot of people get interested in it. So Artie's no idiot. He says, okay, you know, I want to get started. I'm going to start killing people for, for, for cheap, right? So he puts some signs up all around the neighborhood, and it says, you know, we'll kill somebody for a dollar. Puts his phone number down there, got a little tear-off sheet. You know, you can call Artie up, right? So he does this. And he goes, goes home and sits by his phone and waits for the phone to ring. And sure enough, the phone rings. And this guy calls up and says, uh, are you Artie? And he says, yeah, yeah. He says, uh, and you kill people. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he says, for a dollar? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I help you? And he says, well, yeah. He says, I'd like you to kill my wife. And he says, okay. Um, what, uh, how do you want me to kill her? And he says, well, he says, um, if you could strangle her, that'd be great. Sure, why not? Where's she at? So she says, he says well, she's down at the, at the grocery store right now. If you go down there right now, you can go strangle her, and I'll pay you the dollar. Okay? Artie says, piece of cake. So he goes, gets the description. He goes racing down to the grocery store, and he goes down to the produce section, and there she is. Right? There she is. He says, so he goes up, and he grabs her from behind, he strangles her right there in the grocery store and kills her right there in the grocery store. His career as a hitman has just started, right? He's feeling pretty good, and he looks around and goes, oh, S-H-I-T. There is somebody who saw me, you know? 
well, if I have a witness, you know, I'm going to get arrested. They're going to take me to jail. My career as a hitman's over. So he goes and he grabs this person that sees them and he strangles them. Whew, that was close. Until he sees that somebody else saw him. Goes and does this. And I'm like, oh, man. My, what, what, I, I shouldn't have got out of bed this morning, right? He strangles this person and figures, I'm getting out of here before anybody else sees this. He goes racing out of the grocery store and the police go chasing him, all right, and catch him. And the headline in the newspaper the next day says, Artie chokes three for a dollar at the grocery store. <laughs> you see why that's my favorite joke? I'll let you laugh as much as you want at that. That's good. <laughs> the longer you laugh, the less I will say today, too. So that works, too, I guess. OK. There's a limit. There's a limit. All right. OK. OK. So now that my mind is working again, we can get back to talking about DNA replication. These guys start out as triphosphates. OK? They start out as triphosphates. And during the replication process, these two phosphates get clipped off, and this phosphate gets attached to that 3' prime hydroxyl. The clipping off of these two phosphates gives energy for this process to occur, because those phosphates are really where the energy is stored in this molecule. So making a phosphodiester bond requires energy, and the energy is actually carried by the nucleotide that gets built in. It's pretty cool. OK. Well, this process goes on and on and on and on and on until the end is reached. And when the end is reached, everything falls off, and the, the strand has been duplicated. OK. If we think about what I just described to you, we think about perhaps there's a way I can muck with the process. One of the things that biochemists are really good about doing is mucking with processes. That's one. And number two, they're very lazy by nature. So they find easier ways to do things. Well, I'm not going to tell you about that, although I'll give you some examples of that later. But the mucking with the process thing can turn out to be really useful if we're thinking about drugs. I'm not talking about hallucinogens here. I'm talking about treating cancers and treating problems, treating HIV. Okay? If you think about what you want to do when you've got a cancer cell or you've got a cell infected with a virus, what you would like to do is you would like to stop the DNA from being copied in there. Remember that even a retrovirus is going from RNA into DNA. So if we stop DNA from being copied, we can stop a retrovirus, we can stop a cancer cell, we can stop anything that we want to. Okay. So biochemists, being the people that they are, say, well, let's look at what's necessary for the replication process to occur. Let's look at the previous slide and remind ourselves about what I just showed you. Okay. Here's what's happening. This phosphate is getting attached to this hydroxyl. Okay. Let's think about what if this guy right here was something other than what you see here. What if it were a modified nucleotide such that there's, I could put phosphate onto there, put three phosphates on there, and this guy would get incorporated into the growing DNA, but what's going to happen next? There's no hydroxyl for the next guy to attach to. I can put this one in with a phosphate on there, but I can't put the next one in. I've just created what we call a chain terminator. And the beauty of this is it blocks anything else from going on. I can completely stop DNA replication with a chain terminator. Okay. Not surprisingly, AZT is used to treat HIV. You hear about the drug cocktails that HIV patients take to control the level of the virus that they have? One of the things those cocktails contain is a AZT. Another thing they contain is something called DDI, dideoxyinosine. All right, you don't need to know that name, but just DDI. And look, it doesn't have all it has is a hydrogen there, 
Again, there's no place to put the next phosphate. These are both chain terminators. Chain terminators are very good at slowing HIV's progression. We can't completely stop it, but we can slow it significantly. Okay? Okay. So, knowledge about how these processes work allow us to do some pretty amazing things. Creating drugs here is a really good example. All right. Well, I've been giving you some just so, some um, uh, general things about the replication. Now what I'd like to do is take a look at a replication process happening up close and personal. Okay? This shows what we call a replication fork. At a replication fork, we have DNA being synthesized. Okay? Now this is a simple replication fork. I'm going to show you a more complex one in a little bit. Okay? But I want to introduce the topic to you because what happens here is almost hard to believe. I shouldn't say almost hard to believe. It's hard to believe, period. Okay? It's a difficult process to believe. And you'll see why I say that in just a second. All right? We see that there's something up here called a leading strand, and there's something down here called a lagging strand. Notice the anti-parallel nature. The leading strand is going from left to right, and you see it in one continuous piece. The lagging strand is going from right to left, and we see it in individual pieces. Okay. Those pieces have a name. They're called Okazaki fragments. O-K-A-Z-A-K-I. Okazaki fragments are the pieces that we find in the lagging strand. The leading strand only has one piece. Now I'm going to come back to that in a little bit and tell you why they're in pieces. It's, this is something students find a little, <coughs> excuse me, a little complicated. All right? But I want you to get a general picture of what's happening. The DNA polymerase is sitting right here at the place where these new strands are being made. Okay. If we look at this process occurring in an E. coli cell, we begin to get an idea about why it almost seems impossible to understand. Okay? I'll give you an idea. If we look at an E. coli DNA, there's only one origin, only one place where it starts. It goes bidirectionally out. There's three million base pairs that have to be copied. And that entire chromosome in E. coli is copied in as fast as 20 minutes. If you do the math, what you discover is that replication in E. coli is occurring at the rate of about 1,000 nucleotides a second. 1,000 times a second, the polymerase is reading the base, getting the proper nucleotide to put in parallel to it, making that phosphodiester bond, sliding down, and continuing that process. And as we will see, it's also proofreading its work. We'll see that later. Now, proofreading is a good thing to call it, because if we think about what you do when you type something up, by the way, these don't have spell checkers. Okay. They have to read it themselves. They have to proofread it themselves. And spell checkers, in my experience, are worse than some, in some cases than the original thing, right? They give you, make you look like an idiot in some cases. Okay. I'm sure we've all had this experience, including me. All right. All right. This process is occurring at 1,000 nucleotides a second at an error rate of about one in, in E. coli, that is, at a rate of about one in every 10 million base pairs. Imagine typing 10 million characters at the rate of 1,000 characters per second and making one error in that process. It's pretty hard to fathom, right? Pretty hard to fathom. There's something else that's pretty hard to fathom. If we're going to copy this, you can see that we have to have single strands because the polymerase has to read what's in that single strand in order to copy it. That's what you saw in the last figure. That means something's got to be pulling apart those strands. And if we're going to copy 1,000 nucleotides a second, that means we've got to be pulling apart the strands at at least 1,000 nucleotides a second to catch up. Well, if you do the math, 1,000 nucleotides a second, and there's 10 base pairs per turn, 
That means 100 turns per second, which means that guy is working at 6,000 RPM. It's pretty hard to fathom. That's faster than your car engine is working, folks. 6,000 RPM. And it's not working powered by gasoline. It's powered by those triphosphates that I told you. It's a phenomenal process. It's an absolutely phenomenal process. Now, I'm not going to show you today. I will show you on Friday a video. In fact, you can find it yourself on the class page that will show you this process is more complex than I can describe to you in words. Because there's all kinds of orchestration that has to happen to make this whole thing work and work right. Okay? You might say, well, if you get pulling these guys, oh, by the way, the, the enzyme that pulls the strands apart is called a helicase. H-E-L-I-C-A-S-E. -E. Helicase unwinds DNA. It unwraps DN the DNA strands. And yes, it works at 6,000 RPM. You might think, if I get pulling the strands apart here, what's going to happen down here? Aren't they going to get more tangled up? And the answer is, yes, they will. If we don't relieve that tension ahead of where we're pulling those strands apart, they're going to tie up in a knot. And knotted DNA, I hate to tell you, isn't going to get copied. There are enzymes up here ahead of the replication fork that are relieving that tension. They're actually cutting one of the strands and allowing it to go zzzz and relieve the tension. Okay. Those enzymes are called topoisomerases. I'll spell that one for you. T-O-P-O-I-S-O-M-E-R-A-S-E-S. -E -E -S. And yes, that'll be in the notes. OK. Now, I'm going to give you more of the details about this whole process on Friday. Before I do that, I want to ask for questions. Everybody's exhausted. Still laughing at the joke. You're going to tell your friends. OK. How about a song? What do you say to finish it, right? All right. The song I have actually relates to what I finished the, the first topic with. And it's to the tune of the old Flintstones. You guys like the Flintstones? OK. You remember the theme song of the Flintstones? Flintstones, meet the Flintstones, they're the modern Stone Age family. His stones, tiny his stones, wrap up eukaryotic DNA. Using lysine side chains, they arrange a chromatin array. With them, DNAs of seven feet sit inside the nucleus so sweet. When you use the his stones, you have to deal with condensation and its ablation inside your chromosomes. All right, see you guys Friday.